Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harry Swan. I am the recently appointed chair of the Board of Trustees here at uh, SCI, and it gives me great delight to be hosting this afternoon's uh, SciTalk webinar. Uh, we have a little bit of housekeeping first. So uh, in a minute, I'll introduce our speaker, but there will be a chance at the end of the session uh, to ask questions. Uh, you are, attendees are only in listen mode, so um, you are muted, uh, but please do use the Q&A button to ask questions and we'll try and get through as many of those uh, as possible. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Professor Dame Ottiline Lacer, who is Chief Executive of UK Research and Innovation, or UKRI, and Regis Professor of Botany at the University of Cambridge. UKRI brings together the UK's research councils, Innovate UK and Research England, operating with a combined budget of more than eight billion each year. Professor Dame Ottiline Lacer was appointed Dame Commander of the British Empire in 2017 for services to plant science, science in society, and equality and diversity in science. And as a fellow plant scientist, I'm really looking forward to her talk this afternoon. So P Professor Dame Ottiline, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. It's great to be here. Um, not very much plant science in my talk, but um, maybe we, I'll, I'll do a plant science one on another occasion. <laughs> so uh, it, it's really good to be here. I want to say a little bit about how I see the research and innovation system and the role UKRI can play in that system. And I'm really keen to get your input and feedback and questions, because I think um, SCI is a really um, good forum for the the um, vision that I have. It really fits very well as a, a key organization in the kind of system that I think we need to build. So I'm particularly keen to get your input. We are, as UKRI, um, just starting the development of a new five-year strategy. So it's really good to have the opportunity to um, meet the membership of SCI and, and similar bodies to try to, uh, to get some feedback and input into how we're doing. So um, I want to discuss the role of research and innovation in the economy and particularly in the context of the kind of inclusive economy that this government are seeking to build in the wake of the pandemic. The uh, Treasury published the Build Back Better plan for growth um, fairly recently and highlights innovation, skills and infrastructure as core priorities used in the service of delivering net zero, leveling up and the global Britain agenda. And uh, collectively, I think what this highlights is the desire to build a more inclusive and a greener knowledge economy to build back following the pandemic and to capture the benefits of the extraordinary and creative research base that we have in the UK that can underpin this kind of more inclusive, greener knowledge economy. So um, what does an inclusive knowledge economy look like? I would say that at present, we have a relatively exclusive economy. There's significant wage inequality. These are quite old slides now, quite old data, but um, uh, things have not got any better in the meantime. There is significant wage inequality, and this is associated with a significant gap in productivity um, between firms. And this isn't just about manufacturing. These slides actually come from the service sector. And so right across the economy, we have um, both wage and productivity inequality. And this maps onto inequality in the distribution of productivity, and hence that wage inequality right across the country with um, pockets of very high productivity uh, industry and business and uh, large areas of the country with much lower productivity. And this is a key input into the inequalities we see more generally across the country. So a, a key part of the levelling up agenda is, is a productivity levelling up exercise. And there is very good evidence that um, productivity is correlated with 
um, research and innovation investment by companies and and so i think research and innovation has a really important role to play in building that more inclusive uh, uh, knowledge economy that is um, that creates value and benefit right across the uk so that gap in productivity and wages has emerged at a time of very rapid social change and very rapid technical change and the gap as i said is um, the, the evidence suggests that it's largely explained through the um, rapid development of new technology, so rapid technological change. And uh, this quote by Diane Coyle, I think, sets it out. The main candidates to explain these patterns of inequality are globalization and technology, and both have contributed to increasing the wage premium earned by skilled workers there we're back to skills while at the same time limiting the increase in, in earnings of medium and low skilled workers and that's that productivity gap and the literature by and large finds that technological change is the main driver of that um, uh, inequality so the adoption and diffusion of new technologies has a big impact on uh, productivity in, in firms and combining these things, I think the rapid social change, along with these technological changes that underpin um, wage inequalities, there are many in our country who feel very left behind and that their children will be um, worse off than they are for the first time in, in many generations. So um, what does the plan for growth do to, um, to rectify those problems? How do we use research and innovation through um, the, the skills agenda and the infrastructure, infrastructure agenda to drive leveling up in the context of additional um, key um, priorities like net zero and building that really strong place in the world that will, for example, drive uh, uh, foreign direct investment and, and contribute to that plan for growth. At the core of this, it is that this concept, this important concept of a, a, a knowledge economy. We are, as I say, an incredibly strong nation when it comes to the creation of knowledge to research and discovery. We really are completely world leading. And so it seems crazy not to use that world leading capability to fuel our economy, especially when we know that those knowledge economies that are um, able to adopt new technologies very rapidly are those high productivity economies that provide um, high wage jobs. So a knowledge economy we can define as the production of services based on knowledge intensive activities that contribute to an accelerated pace of technical and scientific advance. Um, and that creates a very dynamic environment. There is, of course, then rapid obsolescence and, and disruption as a result of that. And that um, on the one hand, it's a tremendously exciting opportunity, but also contributes to the anxieties people have about the future. So in the Public Attitudes to Science survey, whilst 78% of people think the UK must develop its science and technology sector to, re to remain competitive, so people recognise the real importance of science and technology in fueling the economy with hardly any disagreement, this creates in a decent, in a substantial section of the population an anxiety about what that means for them. So only 57% of people think that there will actually be more work opportunities for the next generation, with a significant number of people disagreeing. And that those numbers are, are not disastrous, 57% and 14%, but in this survey, which um, very uh, overall has a very high um, positive um, feeling to it, those numbers are, are quite worrying, that there are significant numbers of people who think that despite the um, centrality of science, or in fact because of it, there is a concern about the production of those high quality jobs for future generations. And a large part of that, I think, comes from where research and innovation sits in our society conceptually. It, we've built over many decades now the concept of research and innovation as a kind of separate activity. If you say um, uh, research or, inno or innovator to somebody, the, the image that pops into their head is of a very particular sort of person. They are um, kind of some kind of boffin Einstein-like figure. They're working in some rather uh, um, strange shiny laboratory or a kind of dusty archive somewhere. They are segregated from the rest of the society and they're not normal people. 
there's somebody else. And that segregation of research and innovation into that um, other part in our society, I think is incredibly problematic. It, it narrows the range of people who aspire to contribute to the research and innovation system, um, and particularly who, who aspire to becoming themselves researchers and innovators. And that um, makes it much harder also to connect the research and innovation system to societal needs. If, it, if, if it's a separate group of people over here who are somehow other, that barrier between um, research and innovation and society builds inherently exclusivity into the knowledge economy. It's, it's the privileged few over there um, and they are, they are not us, they are not the mainstream in society. And I think this is a, a really key goal to, to break down those barriers. And the nurse review, which is the review that led to the establishment of UK research and innovation had at its core, the need for a, a compact that bonds science and society, which will deliver both excellent science and ensure that it's used for the public good. And that for me is one of my favorite lines in the whole nurse review and is very high on my agenda coming into UK research and innovation to to build that compact, to embed research and innovation much more broadly across society um, so that we can break down those barriers, attract into the research and innovation system the full range of talent that we need, connect up the aspirations of the system, the focus of the system, um, the, the priorities of the system with those broader societal needs and uh, create a research and innovation system that builds that inclusive knowledge economy as a collective endeavor for the whole of society um, by the people for the people rather than as the exclusive domain of a privileged few. So um, as I say, UKRI uh, emerged from the recommendations of the nurse review that had that um, imperative to build a compact between science and society at its heart. As you heard in the introduction, we are um, uh, the largest public sector funder of research and innovation in the UK, formed uh, three years ago now by bringing together the um, nine um, councils, that's the seven disciplinary research councils, Innovate UK and Research England, who work really closely with the equivalent bodies in the devolved administrations to support uh, uh, universities through um, core funding and also knowledge exchange funding. So that means we cover all the disciplines and all the sectors where research and innovation are conducted and that unique breadth and depth of our reach, I think gives us a, a key place in the system to try and build that much more inclusive system that does break down the barriers between research and innovation and society. Now, um, we are spending a very large amount of public money, so we are obviously accountable to government and uh, our ambition to, to support that really thriving uh, knowledge economy in the UK, that means we, uh, it's absolutely vital that we view or understand our role in the very large research innovation system and work very closely in partnership with academia, with business, with the public sector, the third sector, and of course, with international partners. Thinking about that system, research innovation system, uh, we tend to conceptualize it in this kind of rather simplistic way, that there's discovery um, research where brilliant new ideas arise. And then there is a sort of linear pathway that takes those new discoveries and translates them into products. And we, we think about it as a linear pathway and we think of it as a, as a unidirectional pathway with, with the flow of, of ideas and information going along it in that way. And this is, um, everybody knows that this is a gross oversimplification. In fact, it's, it's, it's worse than that. It's just deeply misleading. But at the same time, I guess because we're people and the way we think and that linear uh, uh, storyline is deep in the way we conceptualize things, it's very hard to shift this um, linear connection between discovery and product and the process that um, is research and innovation. And so a lot of the systems that we build around research and innovation focus on investing money either in the discovery, which produces papers, or in the, that kind of product development end, which produces companies or patents. And um, we neglect this piece in the middle, which has become known in the UK then as the Valley of Death. And the Valley of Death is very often conceptualized as a funding valley, and that's certainly an important 
one element of it, but it goes much beyond that. I think it's a it, it's a, a break in our system where um, it, it's much harder for people, for ideas, uh, and for skills to flow. Harder to to move um, ideas and people around the system to connect it up sufficiently to give the kind of connected joined up research and innovation system that we need um, to realize that that um, compact that I talked about at the beginning because uh, as I said although we have this linear path in our mind and it shapes a lot of how we think about research and innovation the system in reality looks something much more like this um, the the flow of ideas and it is definitely not linear it's definitely not unidirectional and until we really think about the system in this much more um, realistic way, um, I think it's going to be much harder to capture the, the full benefits of the uh, creativity and the, the discovery um, components that we have, and also the creativity and the, the extraordinary value generated in, in by our innovators working in all kinds of sizes of, of business. That um, connection, the, the pull through of those discovery ideas to feed the, the innovation engine is at least as crucial as the push out from the discovery um, base into uh, spin out companies and so on and so forth. And, and that join up that we need to connect the, the, the full system mean, is about much more than researchers and innovators, much more than um, that single line that we tend to draw as the thread connecting them at present. So I think UKRI has a, a, a really important role in both understanding that whole system and investing wisely to, to support the system and the join up within it. So the way I see our mission is, um, <clears throat> or rather our vision, is for that outstanding research and innovation system in the UK. And crucially, it needs to be inclusive. It needs to give everyone the opportunity to contribute and to benefit. And through that, we will build that compact that Paul spoke of so eloquently. And through that, we can really enrich lives locally across the UK, nationally, and of course, internationally. And we have, as UKRI, quite a range of tools to support that um, vision. We absolutely have an awful lot of money, as you heard, to invest in a diversity of activities that can support the mission, but also we can convene and catalyze and collaborate very closely because of our reach right across the research and innovation system. And I think that's really important that we use all of those levers um, to build the thriving inclusive research and innovation system that connects things up in that way that I uh, described. So underpinning how we need to work then, I think are these core principles. We need to think about the question of diversity. Are we supporting the right um, range of people, the right range of ideas, the right range of institutions, the right range of infrastructures, and um, uh, the right? Do we have the right set of instruments to allow us? To, um, to do that, to support that full range of activity that we need. What is the portfolio that we need? And are we effectively using the, the levers that we have to support that? But that's how I view diversity in its broadest sense, absolutely about people, but also about all the other components in the system. And that diversity, the benefits of it, we will only get if the system's properly joined up. So diversity with connectivity, diversity with collaboration is key really to harness the synergies um, um, that, that you find in diverse systems. And through that connected diversity, we will build in resilience. We need to think very specifically about resilience, I think, and the sustainability of all the different parts of the system. Can it resist the kind of shocks we've um, faced over the last couple of years? And none of those things, I think, can be properly supported. We can't um, understand that really diverse portfolio of activities that we need to um, to support unless we're deeply engaged with all the communities that are um, crucial in, in, in the research and innovation system, which in my view is essentially everybody. So uh, using these principles, we need to understand then how we support the key elements in the system. People always at the center, their ideas, absolutely crucial, the infrastructures that we need to allow those um, people and ideas um, the people to realize their ideas and then uh, 
connectivity again, um, I'm, it, it really does appear in both places. We have to think about it in everything that we do, and we have to be willing to invest specifically in connecting things and joining things up. And if we have a connected system with the right infrastructures and people supporting the, that full diversity of ideas, we then need the ability to target that at key national priorities, that system, in the way that we've seen so incredibly effectively, uh, the system being targeted to deliver vaccines, for example, in the UK. How does that work in the context of UKRI? We have this wide portfolio of investments. Um, this financial year, for example, we're investing a little bit more than 10% of our budget in, in skills, in people specifically, mostly in PhD studentships, but also uh, uh, more advanced fellowships. Uh, so uh, really thinking about the, the different top areas where we need to train the next generation is, is a key element, so diversity in that portfolio, but also the balance between, for example, investing in people in, in those specific skills and investing in ideas. So um, we have, uh, a variety of response mode um, grant programs. The, the one that a lot of people in universities think about are these fully open response mode programs where you write a grant to do whatever you like. Um, it's very competitive, obviously, but um, that's a core part of our budget really to support those um, completely free and open ideas. And that's about 12% of our budget. And then a similar program where we're nonetheless targeting a little bit more. So um, uh, uh, channeling investment into particular areas such as artificial intelligence or something where we think that there is a, a key need to, to increase activity and, and to focus. So um, that's uh, supporting ideas. Obviously, those projects also employ people and those people also um, gain skills and talent. So there's not a, a clear distinction between our investment in fellowships and PhD students and our investment in those um, open response mode projects. But um, uh, nonetheless, um, we can uh, divide them out in that way because uh, the search projects that we fund are, are very focused on the ideas that are being tested and um, developed in the in those um, uh, project applications. Then um, we fund we put a lot of money directly into universities through um, so-called QR, so that's the money that's awarded in response to the REF, and universities can use that completely flexibly to support their um, research activities and to, um, to frame, to drive their research strategies. Um, more widely, we support very specific um, infrastructures, um, a variety of um, uh, key national infrastructures like the diamond light source, for example, and uh, but um, down to uh, um, equipment that is embedded across things like universities. So key um, element of, of allowing people to do the research they want to do is having the right equipment. And then we support uh, uh, about 10% of our budget goes into research institutes and facilities, and they range from delivering core national capabilities in particular areas through to really um, free research institutes that are delivering cutting edge science like the M um, MRC um, Laboratory for Molecular Biology in Cambridge, which um, is, has been dubbed the Nobel Prize um, factory. So um, investments then in, in those kinds of, uh, of areas, and then the next kind of group of investments are, are in innovation. Um, so responsive mode innovation where companies can apply to, for funding to support their ideas in that open way, but also um, uh, institutions and infrastructures for innovation like the catapults, which really play a, quite an important role, I think, in joining up the system in, in, in support and collaboration between the university research base and companies. And then and more recently, we've had, I think, uh, increasingly huge amount of success through this challenge-led funding approach um, pioneered in the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, where there is money that goes into solving particular um, industrial challenges, like, for example, improving battery technologies. And then um, international collaboration is always uh, really important to network our research base internationally and to understand the opportunities for um, uh, 
our research activity in that wider global environment and to tackle global challenges. And at the moment, of course, we, we still have a significant amount of investment in, in um, specifically in, in targeting the challenges thrown up by COVID-19. So that diverse portfolio of investment um, that funds a diverse portfolio of activity, um, people of their various kinds, ideas, um, uh, infrastructures, organizations, and then um, uh, innovation and the connection between them um, that allows them to realize impacts, which again, I won't go through, but um, multiple types of impact, um, uh, improving the, the economy and public services right across the UK. So uh, that a sort of flavor of the diversity of the work that we do and the, the levers that we have, um, I think right at the center of it is this issue of people. And as I highlighted at the beginning, when we say research and innovation, we tend to think about these lone genius researchers beavering away by themselves, doing brilliant things. And that pe these people exist, they're wonderful. We would like them in our system, but uh, they are actually a tiny minority of the people in the research and innovation system, um, both in the context of people who would label themselves as researchers. Most researchers these days work in um, teams, uh, interdisciplinary teams or, or teams within a discipline. And then of course, there are a huge number of people needed to allow these people to do what they do. So the, the research and innovation system needs far, far more people than just researchers and innovators. I think that concept of the lone genius beavering away in their lab is one of the main um, uh, elements that erects that barrier between people and the rest of the system um, and the research and innovation system. And I think a key component to creating that much more um, porous relationship between research and innovation and wider society and across the research and innovation system is a focus on people, on understanding who we need to be in the system and on how they can develop their career in diverse and flexible ways to meet their needs and their personal aspirations because they probably don't want to be Einstein or most of them don't anyway um, and uh, also the needs of the system to build that diverse connected system that I've talked about. So as well as um, uh, the researchers and innovators themselves there are a plethora of people who work around them. If you work in a lab you might immediately think of technicians who are indeed super important but I think we need to zoom out further and think of the full range of people needed to create the environments where research and innovation happens. All of those people are a key part of the research and innovation system. So that would include um, the finance administrators, the project managers, the IT support people, the comms people, um, all kinds of, of different people that all contribute. I think we need to think about all of these people as key and they are key both uh, uh, to enable the thing to work, but actually as a, a, a really important part of the community that the a research institute where I worked and um, before taking up this job, um, it, it worked really well because it was a community and the, the security people and the um, admin support people were a key part of that community that really gave the flavor, the, the environment, the culture of the institute um, and, and that was very important, I think, to, to how we worked and how we managed to build a, a really collaborative environment. And that's something I think um, we need to think about very carefully as we um, build this inclusive research and innovation system. The other thing I think is really valuable about this is many people in um, across our country, across our economy, don't particularly see themselves as researchers and innovators, but might easily see themselves in one of these other roles. And if they can come into the system in one of these other roles, um, they can have a very fulfilling career in that, in that role or bringing them in closer to the system might uh, open people's eyes to the range of opportunities there are in research innovation and uh, lead to a, a, a whole additional range of careers um, that map routes through the system, including into and out of active research roles. So I think, really highlighting the value of all of these roles is super important in, in creating that inclusive system. And that means um, connecting the research and innovation system deeply, not only into higher education, but also into further education and into the school system. And of course, it means networking 
right across all of the types of organization that conduct research and innovation. And this is where I think SCI is, is such a valuable um, uh, um, set of people with whom to talk. Well, I'm hoping for a really interesting conversation when I get to the end of this talk, um, because you really do span this system and your members really walk the walk that I'm talking about, the journey, these braided careers right across the system in, in different permutations and combinations. And so uh, a core part of what I think we need to do is get that highly mobile um, set of people and ideas moving through this system um, in the UK, but in, indeed um, globally to join it up and create the, the different permutations and combinations dynamically over time, which is where all the really cool new ideas come from where the innovation happens, where the discovery happens. So uh, we have a whole range of activities at UKRI that we're uh, um, pursuing that we hope will, will achieve exactly this. And um, covering the, the kinds of things that I've, I've um, mentioned as I've gone through the talk, the important elements that I think we need to deliver to create that diverse connected system. So um, here's a list. It looks like a list of bits and pieces, but that's actually the way you have to work, I think, if you're intervening to change a system. There's no silver bullets. It's about multiple aligned and carefully targeted interventions that shift the system um, from where it is now, which I think is far too balkanized, to where I think it should be, which is a much better connected system that, um, that works for a much wider range of people because it values and incentivizes a much wider range of careers in the system. You know, at one end, there is something that's, that's really a, a, a kind of a PR exercise in some ways. The 101 Jobs That Change the World campaign, which I would encourage you to go and look up. It's a, a, a set of little videos of different people working in the research and innovation system who would not think of themselves as researchers or innovators, but who nonetheless uh, are, contribute massively to that system and that's where I hope a much wider range of people will be able to see themselves and how they could contribute and how they could make a difference and change the world and in coming into the system and seeing themselves as part of the system and um, transform the system into that much more inclusive environment that I think we need and then yeah, so so moving from from that kind of very open um, advertising campaign almost that highlights that, that that diversity of roles I also think it's important that formally people working in the system have the opportunity to describe um, their contributions and so we are introducing um, widely into our uh, um, assessment systems but also working very closely with partners to try and roll this out more broadly uh, a more narrative style, style CV based on the Royal Society's resume for researchers. So instead of a CV that says, you know, I work here, these are my qualifications, these are the papers I've published, these are the grants I've won, it is a CV, um, brief CV in four sections. Section one is about your contribution to, to your knowledge, to ideas. So is that whether that's research or innovation, how you've really contributed to um, the, the core kind of outcomes of research and innovation. Um, and you can use all kinds of evidence, not just your papers or um, whatever, to, 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 to evidence your contributions. Then there's a, a section on um, how you've uh, supported and mentored those around you. So um, if you've trained PhD students, if you've worked in some interdisciplinary team, how you have supported the other team members. So, so how you work with people in teams uh, or contribute to the next generation through teaching, for example. Um, then there's a section about how you've contributed to the wider research and innovation system. So um, you are um, running a conference, you are refereeing other people's grants, you are um, uh, participating in SCI activities, whatever it may be. <laughs> and then the fourth section is how you've engaged with wider groups of stakeholders. So um, whoever's, wh whoever is, is outside your, your group, um, are you really breaking down those barriers and building that connected system? Are you um, working in schools? Are you um, uh, conducting wider public engagement activities? Are you uh, a university researcher who's engaging in different industry uh, collaborations, that kind of thing. So we um, have 
the, the resume for researchers, as I say, emerged from a Royal Society project, looking very carefully at the things that researchers and innovators need to do to build that high quality connected system, not just the research and innovation that they do, but the other things that are really key part of their job and broken into those four categories and providing an opportunity to evidence that in multiple ways. And one of the key goals there is to allow people to move between sectors simply and easily because the skills and the contributions that they've built up in one sector can be understood and assessed in another sector, which currently doesn't work so well. If, you, if you're in the industry and you want to move into academia and you haven't got the right publications, that puts people off and it's wrong. So um, a, a really fueling that mobility through making it recognizable what somebody from one part of the system can contribute in another part of the system. And that's key because if we continue simply to, to um, build a system that's balkanized where people with one set of skills work over here and people with another set of skills work over there, we will not capture the benefits of that diversity, which is so important in, in the creative research system. So um, uh, beyond that, we can create funding mechanisms that directly support people to move between systems, um, be that um, uh, kind of embedded internships in PhD programs or a very specific um, funded uh, mobility schemes, um, collaborative programs like um, apprenticeships or fellowships, where a key part of holding that um, uh, training grant, be it an apprenticeship or a fellowship or whatever, requires you or involves you um, spanning different um, parts of the system. Um, those key collaborative inf infrastructures I mentioned, catapults earlier, that bring people together from different parts of the system. I think brokerage specialists are also really important that um, their job is to, is to find the connections and build the connections that, that the um, different participants across the system would value. So um, the KTN is a good example that, that um, works with businesses to find the, the um, academic partners that would be most useful to those businesses. I think that that specialist connection function is really important because many of many people who are um, beavering away in, in industry or academia or wherever they may be don't have the time to spend to look hard for their perfect um, research and innovation partner. If somebody else is um, supported specifically to do that. We can build those high quality connections that way. And I think that maps a little bit onto the last bullet here, which, which is challenge led funding, which I also mentioned earlier, where um, we, you, can, you can bring together the really diverse teams of people to address a core challenge. And that those teams can be built bottom up with the people you know already, but they can also be built top down with a program manager who, who brings together those key uh, uh, and diverse contributors needed to solve uh, a key industrial challenge. So it's this kind of uh, portfolio of different investments of different interventions that I hope we can put together to align to, to um, create that much more connected and diverse system that genuinely breaks down the barriers um, within the system, between different sectors in the system, but also crucially between the research and innovation system and wider society and, and solves that um, deep problem that um, was highlighted in Nurse of, of the separation. Marrying up the core principles and the key elements in those, through those diverse intervention mechanisms to deliver the connected up system that I've described. And I think it's only through doing that that we will be able to realize the vision of the plan for growth um, and genuinely build an inclusive, greener knowledge economy that works for everybody that achieves levelling up, for example, um, across the UK, um, bridges those um, inequalities, and at the same time, creates the solutions to the global challenges we face, like net zero, in an environment, in a way in which we can um, uh, export that expertise and learn from colleagues overseas to build the science superpower that the government are so keen on. So I will stop there and thank you very much for listening. And I'm really keen to hear your comments and suggestions on how to achieve that kind of connections. Or maybe you don't think that's the right thing to do and I'd be happy to hear about that too.
David Ottoline, thank you. Uh, I think that was a fascinating talk. So, uh, I'm to take some questions. Uh, we've got a few that have come through the question uh, Q&A um, button. So, uh, if anyone's listening and wants to add, ask some questions, uh, we'll try and get through a, a few of these now. And the top of the list I've got at the moment is, uh, according to today's FT, page three, uh, G7 governments spend from 0.5% of GDP to 0.8%, with UK, Italy, Canada, and Japan at the low end. Businesses in France, Germany, US, and Japan, uh, in that order, spend considerably more on R&D, 1.3% to 2.5%, than does UK business at 0.9%. In total spend out of the G7, only Canada and Italy are lower than the UK. Any comment? Yeah, so this uh, maps onto the, the, um, the government's target of reaching 2.4% of investment in, in R&D um, by 2027. And 22.4% was the OECD average, the average a few years ago, the UK is at a total of 1.7% at the moment. And uh, that um, is made up of a, an approximate ratio of one to two, public to private. In the UK, the private part involves a, uh, a much higher proportion of foreign investment than in uh, a number of other countries. That one to two ratio um, is reasonably uh, comparable across Europe, particularly, but the really exciting things are the economies that have managed to trip their system into a kind of virtuous circle of public and private sector investment. So public sector investment that really attracts in and drives up the private sector investment. And those are the countries that are kind of off the scale that are not at 2.4%, they're at three and more percent. And um, Germany is, is up there, um, Korea, Israel, those kinds of countries. So we are way behind. And one of the things that is kind of extraordinary and why there is such a focus now on generating this knowledge economy is that despite that incredibly low investment, our discovery research base is absolutely up there. It's totally world leading. Uh, if you do the calculation per amount invested, we, we are number one in the world in a whole variety of contexts. Joining up the system in the way that I've described, it really connects that discovery engine with um, the innovation landscape with business in a really effective way that triggers those positive feedback cycles is exactly what I think we need to do. And it, it requires careful intervention across the system uh, along the, the lines I described, of course, many other things as well uh, in that valley of death needs bridging, not only with people and ideas, but also with a proper finance um, portfolio. And that's where I, where I think we can dig ourselves out of this low productivity economy where we've been stuck for decades now in a really alarming way. And we've got to do that. Or we will not generate the public sector finance that will fuel the public services we want and indeed the investment we need for the next generation of, of research and development. So now to me is an absolutely crucial time to take the public sector investment um, up a notch and to invest it in that careful portfolio that triggers private sector investment in behind it. And for me, that's one of the really exciting things you care I can contribute to because of our reach right across the system and our ability then to, to align different investments across the system to support that more joined up approach. Uh, we have plenty of questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll dive on in. Um, so we have someone asking, so you've touched several times about um, the need for everyone in society, for all the members of society to contribute to research in one way or another. Uh, what policies do you think uh, will help increase this representation of, especially if historically underrepresented groups um, in R&D? It's a huge challenge and a, a large part of the challenge is that, um, is the, the sort, is this narrow concept that we all have of what a researcher and an innovator looks like, um, which has embeds itself over the years into the system. So in, in the academic system, for example, the assessment criteria we use for individuals have become narrower and narrower. And some of the reason underpinning that is, is actually, um, ironically, to, to, to make the system fairer um, by, by creating a really real kind of clarity and objective ideas about, about um, what should be rewarded. But because 
frankly, the object, objectivity in, 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 in creativity is a total pipe dream. <laughs> you wind up in the end crushing creativity by narrowing the criteria against which you're selecting. And so I think a, a really important element for driving up diversity in the system, in attracting uh, a much wider range of people from a much wider range of backgrounds, all kinds of underrepresented groups into the system, requires us to think much more about capabilities as captured on the resume for researchers about really diverse routes through the system rather than trying to squish everybody into the same narrow path through the system. It's not about um, forcing people of all different sorts through a narrow door. It's got to be about taking the wall and the door down so that a much wider range of people can flow more straightforwardly into the system. And that is nothing to do with compromising excellence. That's to do with recognizing that excellence, real excellence comes in multiple forms. And if we don't have all of those forms, we're actually impoverishing our, our system. I mean, I guess a really good example would be, uh, you, you might imagine somebody from school who, who's really excited about um, the care system. They might move initially straight out of you know, school, age 16 into a caring role. And, but from there, build up practice-based experience that leads them to think, oh, this could be done better if we did this or that, or if I had more expertise in this or that. So then maybe they go to university at that stage and then um, through um, building up that knowledge they might go back into the to the industry or the, the sector and again you know work until the point where they think oh it, we really need to understand better the relationship between you know this intervention in the care system and, and outcomes maybe I'd like to do a PhD that kind of into and out of weaving career I think is going to suit a much wider range of people and capture a much wider range of talents for our uh, our system than the, our current thing where you basically have to go to school and never leave um, <laughs> to have a career in academia or if you're really lucky you might get to escape to industry at one point but then you're not allowed back again uh, that that vulcanization is is really a, a real problem and I think that's one of the main things that we need to shift to shift that exclusivity that we see in the current system thank you thank you very much um, we have another question and it actually links up really nicely between what you have just said and what you talked about before about pockets of productivity and leveling up across the country. Uh, so um, the question is, um, it's great to hear about diversity uh, in your talk. You seem to use the term interchangeably, sometimes to mean a range of contributors from different parts of the UK research and innovation network, and sometimes to refer to the more commonly understood idea of diversity, i.e. people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. What's the main thrust from UKRI when it comes to diversity? So um, it, it, that's a very interesting question because it is the case when you say diversity, people immediately lock onto the idea that that means people from legally protected groups. And I, I think that um, that's a, it's a very important definition, but I think one of the main reasons why people from those groups are excluded is because we think about um, the stereotypes of people in the system as, as whom we're expecting to be there. And um, when we're appointing or hiring people or letting people through that door, we're using a very narrow set of criteria that it is much easier for that existing group of people already in the system to meet. So I actually don't think those two things are, are different or exclusive at all. And I think um, we need to, to embrace the concept of, of diversity as difference. If we're um, uh, building a faculty team or a company team or a public service team, um, to build an effective team, it, there's very good evidence that that difference is important. And so when we're adding a new team member, a key question shouldn't be, is this person the same as all the other people on the team? Do they have the same qualifications? Do they make some grade? Can they step over this bar? It's um, what's missing in this team? Um, how are these applicants different from the people we have already? What, they can, what can they add that's different? And I think if we're actively seeking to appoint difference rather than um, to appoint a whole bunch of people in isolation, all of whom meet the same criteria, then we, solve, we, we achieve both of those things at the same time. Um, and that that would be my would be my 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 goal. I think 
uh, the, a, a real problem with the way we conceptualize EDI legal diversity is more to do with trying to cram diverse people into a small set of stereotypes rather than to throw away the stereotypes as unhelpful and create that real interest in difference in the system. We have another question from Peter Hamilton. Uh, that is, does or should the UKRI have a role in encouraging young, especially pre-tertiary education uh, members to feel that they can become involved in science research and innovation? Absolutely. I, I think we have a role in a, in a variety of contexts. Um, one thing that I think is important is that the researchers and the institutions and so on that we support um, uh, should, as one of the things that we value as their funder, um, be uh, engaging very broadly across society, including into schools to, to um, illustrate the wide range of roles that, that are available in the research and innovation system for people. Um, and then, you know, at the other end, our direct action, I would, I would argue our 101 jobs campaign is, is a really good way to engage with people um, below the tertiary education system with, with the opportunities available to them. A, a lot of people in schools are quite fixated on, quite reasonably, on their job and on their careers. And I think anything we can do to, to shine a light on the huge range of opportunities there are in the research and innovation system that do not require you to be Einstein, um, that's really, really important. And, and it's not that, that the, these diverse people we're attracting in are not Einstein, but they don't think of themselves as Einstein. And whilst they, they think they have to live up to a narrow um, set of criteria, they are put off. Whereas if you can demonstrate the breadth and diversity of roles available, it, I think that creates the opportunity for far more people to see themselves contributing in a positive way. And if we go back to the geographical levelling up across the country, um, how do you think is the best way? Because there's the, there's the tendency of especially companies to aggregate, to form clusters, to kind of, and it also has beneficial as aspects, of course, but how do you think is the best ways to, to balance that levelling up across the country to avoid um, pockets of productivity, but at the same time favouring these, these hubs that increase, at the same time they increase productivity in a, in a synergetic way more than just an addition of the, of the parts? Yeah, so I think, that's, I think that's, this is a really important point. Um, because I think it, 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 it speaks to a, a concept which I think is very valuable, which is that of, of smart specialization. So um, uh, you're absolutely right that, that clusters, are they work. They work in all kinds of ways. They work because they of the supply chains into businesses. They work because of the skills um, that are attracted to a particular area. Uh, and it, it, there's a huge amount of evidence that that kind of agglomeration and into clusters is a key part of, of, of the process in, 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 in building the local, local economies. So we need to think uh, really carefully about what the opportunities there are for that all over the country. Um, UKRI operates a, a, a place-based investment called Strength in Places where we um, ask, uh, we fund a local institution, usually a university, to work in close partnership with local government and local industry to, to to agglomerate that kind of cluster to, to what kind of investment would you need to to leverage what's there already to best effect um, there are some fantastic examples of where that kind of thing has happened all over the country and in um, as well as universities as agglomerators there are um, some of those key institutes um, uh, could, should could point to the Dashbury campus in Manchester which is another UKRI uh, investment but um, other public sector research establishments can also Act in that way. And then I'm very excited about the opportunities there are now for the so-called postcode industry clusters, where you don't need a massive infrastructure, particularly to support um, a, an agglomeration in some of the, the, the kind of um, tech-driven or software-driven uh, industries. So, um, I don't know, computer games around um, um, Dundee and Abate. The, the skills element means that quite often local university is important but it's 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 a different kind of phenomenon than where you need you know 
big industry. And another one of my favorite examples is the University of Lincoln, who went very deliberately for agricultural robotics because they're in an area that's uh, where agriculture is very important and they had Siemens locally. So that um, connection of, of, of a major industry with a university and a local need um, uh, came together. And, and in with these postcode industries, that, that kind of that the kind of big infrastructures are not necessary. And so you have more options. So um, yeah, really intelligent, smart specialization, I think is, 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 is the best way to go on, on that wider leveling up agenda. And it's very important to think about it nationally. Otherwise you wind up with multiple regions trying to spot smart specialize in the same area, and then they're competing with one another unhelpfully. So it, it, you've got to think carefully about that local empowerment but with enough national focus not to cause um, unhelpful competition. Thank you very much. And we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll pick a last question um, from John Hudson, uh, which is, have UKRI thought about different specific ecosystems for engaging people in that frontier of research you've discussed before? Different ecosystems for engaging people in frontier research. I'm not entirely sure what the questioner is getting at it i mean obviously frontier research happens in a variety of different contexts it happens in in the business sector it happens in research institutes it happens in universities and um, just at the moment um uh, paul nurse is doing another review <laughs> this time on the on the landscape of institutions that conduct research and innovation and whether we have the right balance i think that's a really interesting question uh, as you heard, UKRI invest in all of those kinds of things. And uh, the question about whether our portfolio is appropriately balanced is key. Um, but then, uh, as I've also tried to emphasize all the way through, how you join those things up is very important. So from an ecosystem point of view, um, uh, yeah, creating the right partnerships that really um, drive that frontier of research across that type, that, 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 those kinds of different landscapes, I think, I think is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liza. Um, I will hand it back to Harry to do the closing remarks. But, but just again, uh, thank you. Thank you for the talk. A really interesting and engaging one. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and thank you, uh, Demofilin, again. I, I think it's been a fascinating talk and it's interesting to hear how UKRI is, is uh, approaching things at the system level um, to solve innovation right the way across the system. That, strangely, the idea that came to my head is that uh, we all think about, uh, you use Einstein, we all think about Daniel Craig as James Bond for getting behind the, the famous actor. There is the enormous uh, system that brings that film to us. And, and maybe the, there's a sort of an analogy there that uh, we can get our heads around as well. Um, and then the other thing that really uh, struck me is you, you talk about Paul Nurse's point about the excellence in science and ensuring it's used for the public good. Uh, and that, of course, is one of the key um, the founding principles of SCI, which is uh, to develop chemistry and related science uh, for industry for the benefit of society. So there's some there's some lovely uh, um, similarities there uh, with your talk and, and what SCI is about. So again, on behalf of SCI, thank you um, so much for agreeing to talk to us and for a fascinating talk. Uh, I've got a little bit more of housekeeping to do. This is really just to talk about uh, SCI membership um, and uh, uh, all of our people who are online today to look at uh, preferential rates on our conferences and networking events. Uh, we've got all sorts of things here which benefit uh, from the membership. Uh, discount on books and journals which are published a, a major part of SCI's activity is in publishing. So um, do have a look at that, uh, including discount rates and room hire, things like that. Uh, and certainly from, from our perspective, I think one of the great things of SCI is extend your business network uh, and the networking that SCI offers. Uh, obviously, we'll get better post-COVID when we all start to, to come together again. Um, a huge amount of com stuff comes out of uh, email alerts and e-bulletins, so do, do uh, connect with those as well. Um, so a, a very wide range of benefits of membership there for, for some of the people joining today who are perhaps not members and may want to think about it. A future webinar plug as well, uh, Wednesday the 6th of October, Nurturing an Emergence ch Chemistry-Based Business Experience in the Sharp End. Wednesday, the 27th of October, a side talk again on how to engage with millions of people. So a fascinating talk, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Tuesday, the 9th of November and Thursday, the 2nd of December, uh, Bright Idea Challenge, the 2022 training workshops. And then on Wednesday, the 24th of November, 
uh, the cycle media in, and the chemical industry. Uh, again, another fascinating talk that we look forward to there. So uh, that gives me a great pleasure to say again, thank you to Jay Mottelin, um, and thank you to all of the people who've joined us online for the webinar this afternoon. I hope you found it interesting, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>